Pintake's presentation of Mr. and Mrs. La Cuesta Gontense by Noel Alderman.
The set is a simple living room in Los Angeles. There is one photo of Mr. and Mrs. Laraquesta's son on the table. There is a door leading into the kitchen. You, our guests, are here waiting for us to arrive. Jay enters the room singing and dancing, carrying signs saying dance meeting. Enter here. Ah, <laughs> you're here. Lori, Alika, come, come. Did you eat? Did, did you see the food? Help yourself. You must eat. How are you? Hmm? Where is the little one? My dear, look at you. Lori, come look. How is your dad? Is he still visiting Manila? Lori! I'm coming, Jay. Shh, here. Help me with my zipper. Oh, you came. I knew you would come. Jay, how do I look? Do I look okay? You, what do you think? You look fine. Fine. Well, doesn't she look fine? Look at all the friends who came. <laughs> good. Good, good, good. The more the merrier. Who are your friends? I have punch and ice cream ready so we can dance all night long. All night, all night. And show pow. Do you like show pow? I ordered it from Betsy's. I hope they have good music. You are all so early. Good. It will give us time to talk. Yes, to talk. Go ahead, take one. It won't bite. Eat, eat. So, how is Lola Marvin and Tita Esther? Oh my God, Jay! Did you see how big? You look at how big he's grown. Jay, look at how big he's grown. Yes, I saw. I remember when you were like this high. Is your mom still feeding you that brown rice? How is your daughter? Did Jay offer you some food? Jay, did you offer them some food? Did Jay offer? Yes, I offered them some food. Well, you did not offer strong enough. Why don't you offer them strong enough? Why don't you go into the kitchen and get some food? In the meantime, I will take your picture so you can send it home to your sister. Sige, smile. Wait, that's not a smile. You can do better than that. When I count to three, one, two, three. Here, eat. Binuguan. Your favorite, more rice? You are all early. That's what I said. Why? You, I don't think we have met. My name is Lori. But you can call me Lori, Tita Lori, Auntie Lori. And this is my husband, Jairo, Jay. Everyone, just call him Jay. Oi. Hello, hello. Aren't you Jay's co-worker? You're a security guard too, like Jay, yes? Did he invite you from work? No? I like you. And you, you look like my sister, Feli. He's dead now. Are you hungry? Eat! <laughs> you, eat! My sister, Feli, taught me how to cook. I cook everything that you are seeing now. At the restaurant where I work on Temple Street, people think that I am the best cook. Yay! I know, I know, I know. I'll get them some more food. We must eat. 
we must eat if we are to keep up with everyone. And you, I can tell that you are a good dancer. <laughs> you promised me a dance, okay? Well, thank you all for coming. I knew you would come. And you, you came dancing with us last time, I remember. When I was getting married to Jay, we got married in Baguio. My mother told everyone in the valley to come. Everyone. Now, she did not have to go far. And we didn't send out invitations like you people do here in the States. Many people did not have phones in our province. So, my inai, my mother, told relatives to tell more relatives. My mama told her sister to tell everyone. Everyone. When our wedding day came, uncles and cousins, lolos and lolas from all over came. Relatives I didn't know I had came. But the point is, you get the word out. And when Filipinos hear about a party, watch out. Here, have some more food. Jay! Jay, honey, don't give them the ginitaan. But it was in the fridge. The ginitaan is for boyet. Oh, for boy. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'll bring it back. No. <laughs> Since it's already out, you give it to our guests. But uh, what about... Just leave enough for him. <laughs> Our son loves ginitaan. It's like a porridge or a gravy, but sweet, very sweet. He used to say, Mom, for my birthday, do not get me cake. Just make ginitaan. <laughs> he would say that. Yes, he would say that. Mom, for my birthday, do not get me cake. Just make ginitaan. Ginitaan is Boyet's favorite. Lots of coconut milk. Boy loves coconut juice. That I rarely make it. Only on special occasions, on birthdays, holidays, special days. Like today. Today we are going dancing. <laughs> Boyette loves to dance. Yep. He got his dancing from me. I won several awards when I was his age. The best dancer in tuba. I was born in tuba, and I was better than everyone in the province, better than everyone in Luzon. People would say, clear the floor. Here comes Manu Jay. Whoever dances against him, better pray. Well, that's me, Manu Jay. <laughs> this is true. He was a good dancer, but I was better. <laughs> ah. Nonsense. No one was better than me. I was Manu J. I would start at night and dance all day. <laughs> Gago, I was a skilled dancer. My mother taught me all of the dances when I was a girl. The kanyao, how to dance the budong, the tinigling, all of the dances. I would dance and dance. I could dance to almost anything. That's true. Almost any country <laughs> music, jazz music, chubby checker, anything. That's how we met, Haje. At a dance contest. They needed a partner. I wanted to compete in a dance contest in Baguio. My girlfriend didn't want to dance with me anymore. His girlfriend dumped him to go to the States. So I needed a new partner. My best friend Cesario said he knows a girl who dances all kinds of dances. Cesario was talking about me. At first I thought, Jesus Christ, she's too skinny. <laughs> oh, Jay. <laughs> but it was good. It was good you were skinny. He could dip me better. At first, it was not so good. Now, we would fight each other. Deciding whose steps were better. Wanted to go fast and be flashy. And I wanted to go more slowly. 
more like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I wanted to fly through the air. We just hated each other. We yelled at each other, but we knew we would be good together. Just a hunch. Yep, a hunch. <sighs> we worked it out. We were fast and flashy. And I watched some Fred Astaire movies. And when the big day came, the day of the big dance contest, everyone from all over came to see. Came to watch? There were 20 couples. Some of them were city slickers from Manila, the big time dancers. I saw their pictures in magazines. There was this one couple, boy, they were tough. They came all the way from Cebu. They were good. They wanted to win so bad. They thought because they were Visayan, they were better than everyone. You know how those Visayans are. Those Visayans are tough. Imelda Marcos is Visayan, you know. Tough. This couple was strong too. Like athletes strong. They looked like they were athletes or something. We were in the final round. Us and the Visayans. They did a tango with goddamn roses in their mouths. Jay, don't swear. We did a tango too. But me and Jay, how do you say? Blew them away. Our tango was perfect. Great arms, great back. Perfect. He twirled me, dipped me perfectly. Perfect. My dress was tight on top and loose on the bottom. When I turned, the bottom part of my dress glided into the air. My hair was slick back, shining. I wore a red carnation in my tuxedo. He looked like a movie star. It was a tough final round, but... We won! <laughs> we won! <laughs> one, one, one. Yes, we won. Well, that's our favorite story to tell. But I'm sure you know that. Boyette heard it a hundred times growing up. He would say, Oh, not the dance contest story again. I heard it a billion times. Boyette would say that a billion times. I heard it. The dance contest story. A billion times, he would say that. Last time we went dancing, we outdanced almost all the young people there. Sometimes we hate outdancing the young people. I yell at them, You, what are you doing? You should be able to dance longer than us. Get up, you're young. Get up, get up, dance, dance. Of course, they would all look at me funny. A couple of times, a few guys flipped me the finger. <laughs> we must stop. We must save our energy for later. That is true. Boyet used to say, Save your grasshopper legs for hopping. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, he used to say that. Save your grasshopper legs. <sighs> Boyet's, a, Boyet's a good dancer. He... He was the hopper. He would jump and leap. Once he jumped over my head. Boy, boy learned to dance before he could walk. This is true. We would put on some music and his crib would shake <laughs> because boy would shake and move. He was a born dancer. Foggy. Yeah, he was handsome. When he was born, I, I, don't, I didn't think so. Oh, Jay. It's true. He was not a good-looking baby. He was a good-looking baby, Gago. He was not. He was born ugly. Anyway. He was a good-looking baby. 
He was not a good looking baby. He was small and he had a little body and, and a great big head. All babies are good looking, Jay. I sus. Let me finish. And he was born so pale, hmm? like milk. If he was so ugly, why did all the girls like him? Because he got better looking when he grew up. Diba? Hmm. This is true. He became better looking when he grew up. His body began to match his big head. But he was still skinny. So skinny. Oh, like me. I was skinny when I was his age. And his skin got some color. He became better looking when he grew up. That's why all the girls liked him. When he was 14, he would get phone calls all night long, it seems. From girls. Is Boy at home? Is Boy at home? They would ask. All of those calls. Oh, I liked him because he was a good dancer, huh, Jay? The best. Swear to God. Jay, don't swear. Jay never swears. He wouldn't think of swearing to God, would you, Jay? No, 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 no. Boyet swears, though. He would swear like a motherfucker. He would say, goddamn this, goddamn that, fuck this, fuck that. He had a mouth dirtier than they like a... Uh, like a the picture, Jay. Boyette just liked words. He was a writer. He liked all kinds of words. Poetic words, long words, classy sounding words. Four letter words. All kinds of words. Laurie would get mad at him for using those swear words. Wouldn't you, Laurie? Well, I just didn't want him to think that it was okay to say bad words whenever he liked. Would you like some more water? No, 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 no. Laurie would get so mad telling him not to speak that way in her house. Laurie would get so mad. But Boyet just kept on talking any way he wanted. <sighs> bullheaded. He was bullheaded like me. He would swear some more, and Lori would get even madder. What are you doing after school today? Lori would ask. And Boyd would say, oh, I got to go to the effing library and do my effing homework, study goddamn Shakespeare. And Boyd would like, hey, you know, you just... don't have to tell. And Lori would get so mad. Her lips would get tight, and her cheeks would get fat like she was about to explode. And she would yell and yell at him. And all Boyet would say is, They're just words, Mama. Just words. They're nothing unless you attach meaning to them. That's right. That's what he would say. Bullheaded. Bullheaded. Well, sometimes I would get upset at him. Would anyone like some more water or... Uh, maybe some more. Sometimes you would get upset. Jay, you don't have to tell this story. Once you took my belt and chased him around the house. You almost chased him out of the house. Don't use those words in my house. Don't use those words in my house. That was only once. And because he called my sister Feli a bad name. He called her sister. A crotchety old bitch. Jay! Well, she was. That boy. Here, have some more Chopau. Crotchety old bitch. He had a way with words. Crotchety old bitch. No wonder he was a writer. Yes, he did write in high school. He wrote and wrote and wrote. Wrote, wrote, wrote. A lot. He wrote beautiful speeches. Boyet and his words. He wrote speeches. Strong speeches. Passionate. He wrote speeches? 
proud speeches for his club. What, what do you call that club? The speech club. Uh, th that's right, that's right. The speech club. He wrote other things too. Proud speeches. Oration. Boyet was a good orator. Speeches weren't the only thing he wrote. He wrote stories, you know, strong stories. Yes, he wrote stories and... And the stories were so good. Published in his school paper. He wrote poetry too. These stories were almost as good as his speeches. His poetry was beautiful. Hajje. I have, I have all the stories he wrote. His poetry was beautiful. Hajje. There was this one story about our family, about how we came to America for a better life. He was born at Kaiser Hospital right in Hollywood. It was a good story. His poetry was so gentle. There was another story he wrote about. Jay doesn't like to talk about Boyet's poetry. Ha, Jay. I have, uh, I have some stories hidden away somewhere. Do you want to read? I have them, I have them somewhere. You. You're almost done with your food. Do you want some more? Jay doesn't like to talk about Boyet's poetry. Speeches and stories are okay, but poems are, you know, something only, you know, poems are something that boys don't do. And Jay is, you know, once, Boyet let me read some of his poems. They were pretty. I always like poems that rhyme, like roses are red, violets are blue. You know, the poem will rhyme with something ending in blue. Now, there aren't too many words that rhyme with blue, like shoe or true or even cockatoo. You sort of know what's coming. There's something comforting in that. Most of Boyette's poems didn't rhyme, except for one, the only one. I didn't understand it at first when I read it. I told Boyette, I don't get it. Try and get it, he said. I read it again and again and again. I still didn't understand. He told me, take it and try to understand. And he said, don't show it to dad. So I didn't. I read that poem every day for a week. I read it whenever I could, trying to understand it. I read it so much, I memorized it. It went. Two flames, flickering and grooving, rhythmically moving, guiding one small dim light. The two fires overcame the small flame until the dim light took flight. I said it over and over myself. I said it so much I turned it into the song. I said, Two flames flickering and grooving, rhythmically moving, guiding one small dim light. The two fires overcame the small flame until the dim light took flight. Two Flames flickering and grooving, rhythmically moving, guiding one small dim light. The two fires overcame the small flame until the dim light took flight. I don't, I don't know where I put those stories. I was telling them about Boyet's poetry. Oh? Yes. <laughs> There is a shoebox in the closet. You'll find Boyet's speeches and stories there. Oh, okay, okay. There's a box on the floor where he wrote other things when he got older. When he met Matthew, 
Here, we have some copies of them for you. You can take it if you want. Matthew is uh, his boy's friend. His good friend. His best friend. Matthew is a, is a good guy, huh? A Lucano boy from Cerritos. His grandpa used to live around here, just over there on Coronado. Third generation? Yes, third. A very nice boy. Boyet uh, met Matthew when he left home. When boy stopped living with us. It was a good thing that he met Matthew Haje. Oh, yeah. A good thing. Matthew made boy happy. Haje. Matthew liked boy's poetry. Understood it better than us. Haje? Yeah, better than us. His poetry was, was different from his other stuff. It was, was more personal. His poetry was about being gay. Haje. Yeah. Do you, Do want, you want more food? <sighs> when Boyette told us he was gay, he was 17. We didn't know what he meant, huh, Lori? No, we are from a small province in the Philippines. We have provincial thinking, I guess. That's what boy said, he said. Mom and dad, you're so provincial. I said, of course, we are from the provinces. From the provinces. That is what we said. When it told us how he was, we didn't understand. Then he explained to us what he meant. We almost had a heart attack. A great big heart attack. Right. Almost a heart attack. A great heart attack. Jay yelled at him and yelled at him. Yelled, yelled, yelled. I told him to stop being that way right now. He said that. We were not as sophisticated as we are now. Let's, let's tell another story. Stop being gay right now. Jay said that. I cried. Yeah. Yeah, she did. Cried, cried, cried. We were so upset. So upset. He tried to explain. But we didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it. Got into a big fight. Big fight. Boy, it said. Please listen to me. I said no. Please. Shut up. I said. But Boyet would not be quiet. So to make him quiet, I hit him. Hard. Don't ever talk about this again. For good measure, I hit him again. Again? And again and again, so hard, Boyette fell to the floor. I shot crying, stop, stop, I said. I said, Boy, your father is right. Let's not talk about this again. Let's not talk again. But Boy is just bullheaded. He would try to talk. You have to understand. We never had a gay person in our life before. I threatened him to send him to military school in the Philippines if he kept talking about it. Never he talked. We ignored him. This is true. Ignored him. There were times when I wanted to talk to him, but Jay told me what did you tell me, Jay? Jay, what did you tell me? I said, no, don't talk to him. He must learn. I obeyed. I obeyed. Stop talking to him. Just stopped. For a whole year, stop talking to him. No, oh, we fed him and gave him clothes to wear. That's all. 
we left little notes around the house saying, don't forget to throw away the basura, the trash, or here is your money for your baon, lunch money left right here on this table. Our house was littered with little notes, but no words came from our mouths. Boyette would say, how was your day, mom? I kept quiet. How was work, dad? And I would just read the paper or, or watch TV. I wouldn't say anything. I kept quiet because, what could I say? I'm fine, work is good. Oh, by the way, are you still gay? Boyette's grades began to drop. He would get in trouble at school. We had to go to the principal's office to get him. Even at the principal's office, we didn't say anything. We would apologize for boy's behavior and drive home, saying nothing. We were just so disappointed in him. He was our only child. I hated him for turning out that way. It came to the point where I couldn't even look at him. I could not even look at him. I kept having those images of men in dresses and walking around like a woman, having sex all the time with anyone. This is my son? Boyette would stay out longer. I'm going to the park, he said. To the park? At least he was staying out of trouble, I thought. He went to a nice park, not far from here, just a few blocks, MacArthur Park. He would be at the park all night long, it seemed. He would go to the park all the time. All the time. Every day. Every night. Then one night, we got another call. It was the police. They arrested Boyette for having sex in the bushes of MacArthur Park. Since he was still a minor, we had to go and pick him up and sign all of these papers. We drove home like we did from the principal's office saying nothing. Sex in the park. It's amazing what a boy will do for love and affection. Isn't that right, Jay? Boy, it was, it was becoming our, our worst nightmare. When we got home, Boy said, Do you have anything to say to me now? We just looked at him. Say something to me, Boy said. Speak to me, anything. But nothing. He just went to bed. I could hear him crying. We could hear crying. The next morning, he said that he was going to stay at a friend's house. I'll be gone for a couple of days. He said that. A couple of days. I thought he was probably going to do gay things. It's driving me crazy. So I got an idea. I decided to put an end to this. I was going to put an end to it once and for all. I decided to move. Moving away seemed like a good idea. We had to. Maybe without us, Boyette would get over this craziness. He didn't move far. Far enough. A few blocks away to Benton Street. We packed up all of our things, told the manager that we're moving, told him not to tell Boyette where we're going. So when Boy came home, we were gone. Nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And we didn't see him for three years gone three years we did not mention his name as if he wasn't born i tried to make the best of it what else could i do at first it was fun we felt free okay. yes free it was like we were young again we went to the movies and dinner free it was like we were dating again. We went dancing. 
We would dance all night. Dance, dance, dance. Yes, we would dance all night. Like we were young again. Making love with the door open. Oh, gee! It was fun. At first. Yeah, at, at first it was fun. Lori began to miss him. I'm his mother after all. His mother. He began to hate Jane having the idea to move away from Boyette. Hated him. Hated myself for going along. Jay and I didn't talk much? No, not much. Eventually, we did not talk at all. We just, we watched, just watched television. TV. All the time. We discovered cable. We watched everything. The news. Comedies, dramas. Commercials, even commercials. We watched a little black box to help us forget our bleak little world. We watched for a long time. Hours, hours, hours. The talk shows, especially the talk shows. Oh, yes. We love the talk shows, all of them. Phil Donahue. Sally Jesse, Oprah. I love Oprah the best. Yes, Oprah the best. We watch her show on, on running the marathon. Her show on shopping and how to wrap Christmas presents. Her weight going up and down. Up and down and up again. I felt for her. She did a show on gay people. Yes, she did. And, uh... How they were not so bad people, anyway. Stuff like that. They seemed like very nice people, anyway. It was a very good show. Yes. And she did another show on family reunions. Very touching. Yes. Touching. It was about how parents never got a chance to see their child because there was something separating them. Yes. Something like that. Or, or they lost touch. I began to think of Boyette. Lori missed him. You too? No. Yes? No. Yes? Well, maybe, maybe a little. We wanted to see him. At least talk to him. We did not know where to start. But Jay had a brilliant idea. A brilliant idea. Let's try the telephone book, I said. <laughs> the phone book. <laughs> yes, I thought of that. He is so smart. The phone book. So we tried. And there he was. In what and white. His number was right there, 6641212. So we called it. 6641212. It rang three times, precisely three times. Then someone picked up. Yo! That's what Boy had first said. Yo! He said that. Yo! <sighs> These young people. And I said, Boyette? This is mom. And I think that was the first time Boyette had nothing to say. I said, this is mom. And dad. And Boyette said, oh my God. Yeah, he did. He said, oh my God. He started to cry. And Laurie started to cry. You too? No. Yes. No. Yes. Well, well, maybe a little. We decided to meet for lunch. Just to talk. I saw him coming to our table. Boy had changed so much. He had all of these, like, 
you know, muscles. I, we, we were happy to see him. So happy. He looked like a man now. He wore a blue t-shirt and jeans. And the way the sun hit his face, he reminded me of Jay when we were young. Guapo, so handsome. I wanted to touch him. It had been such a long time since I touched him and I reached out. But Boyet pulled away. He was pissed off. Jay, don't swear. Pissed off is not swearing. Boy was mad. At us. He was hurt. Yeah, he was hurt badly. He said, What do you want? Just like that. What do you want? And we said, just, just to see you. Yes, just to see you. Boy was pissed. Mad. He said it again. After all this time you want to see me, what do you want? Boy said he wanted to tell us something. He wanted to tell us that. That. He said that. He never wanted. He never wanted to see us again. Diba? I have my own life. I have my own life. That is what he said. I have my own friends, like Matthew. He said, Matthew. He also said. He said. I don't need you. That's what he said. I don't. Need you. We didn't. Yeah. Got up. He got up. He got up, and and left the table. And we didn't see him again for another three years. We didn't see him. I don't need you. That that's what he said. There's some there's some more food on the table, if you want. Help yourself. Hey there. Oh, oh, Matthew! Look at you! Everyone, this is Matthew, boy's friend. Good friend. There's some food on the table. How are you, Matthew? You look good. Matthew is a lawyer. Yes, a lawyer. Eat! You are getting so skinny. Eat! I'm, I'm glad you came. Did Boyet arrive? No, not yet, but he's coming soon. Are you sure he's coming? Yes, yes, I can feel it. He always comes for Christmas, birthdays, on special days. I made Gneta on. His favorite. How far did you get in the story? Oh, how Boyette never wanted to see us again. Are we almost ready to go dancing? Almost. Yes, I. We have to go get money from Mrs. Boteng. She pledged lots of money. We have to go and get it from her before we leave. Mrs. Boteng lives just down the street. You go get it, Jay. You go get it. Mrs. Boteng doesn't like me. She wants you to get it. Mrs. Boteng has a crush on my husband. Every time I go over there, she just talks and talks and talks. She almost talked my damn dear off. <sighs> Don't swear. I'll go with you. You keep them company, Matthew. Eat! Eat! <clears throat> <clears throat> They're nice folks, aren't they? They make good food too. Excellent dancers. I'm sure they dance for you. Did they tell you about the story of how they beat the Bisayans in this dance contest? They were, <laughs> of course they have. I tell it every year. <sighs> well, I'm not very good at social settings.
Boyette was the. He was terrific around people. Terrific. I don't uh, know what they've told you, so feel free to stop me if I'm repeating anything uh, they've said. I met Boyette when I was young. Younger. I was majoring in public health in college. Part of my course study was to intern at a public health slash social service agency. I chose the LA Free Clinic. I became a pre and post test counselor. I went to a three day training course at the American Red Cross. They taught me psychosocial issues on testing, what to do in any given situation, the kind of demeanor I should possess. Neutral. They suggested that my manner, my voice, my body exude neutrality. So the person I'm counseling could feel free to feel whatever it is they feel, particularly if the results aren't what they want to hear. I remain neutral if I say, you have tested positive, you are infected with HIV. I always hated that word. But we were instructed to say infected so the person we were counseling got the message that they have this disease. I had tested over a dozen people, all of them negative, but I knew someday that I would have to tell someone that they were infected. Boyette was the first guy, first Asian guy I ever tested. He was also the first person I ever said, you are infected with HIV. I was ready. I had a three-day training course at the American Red Cross, for God's sake. I had my referrals ready, telephone numbers to give to him to any clinic or hospital of his choice. Boyd said he didn't need any help and walked out of my office. I was coming out myself and met other gay people working in AIDS. They took me to the bars, and clubs. There was one club they took me to. Um, club in Silver Lake, I forget the name. But there he was. Boyette, yeah. dancing, without a care in the world. Obviously the best dancer on the dance floor. I watched him dancing. He caught me watching and I was embarrassed. When the song ended, he came up to me and asked me to talk. I didn't want to mix business with pleasure, but I was young, younger met at the Onyx, drank latte. Seems so mature to order latte. Go through the park. He said, free in the grass. Gave a call. He said he was busted once for peeing in some bush. The cops asked him if he was gay. The boy said yes. And that was all the convincing the cops needed. Wrote him up for lewd conduct. Gave him an infarction. Oh, he's listening. Yes. <laughs> Boyette said he lived in the park for a while. Let his folks up and left him. So he just lived in the park, going home with strangers, sleeping wherever, earning a living, however. I said, your parents left you? What a shitty thing to do. If they were my parents, I would hunt them down and firebomb their home. That was a radical back then. Fuck all the straight people. That was my motto. While he's talking to me, I'm thinking to myself, I am falling madly in love. Boyette and I talked and talked. He told me his dream. His dream. A few days before, I told him he had a terminal disease, and he's telling me about his dreams, his future. Nowadays, there are all these drugs that can sustain a person with HIV for years, but back then it wasn't so. He's telling me he really wants to study dance, join a dance company, and maybe 20 years down the line, start his own company, his face bright with life. And you right then and there, he was mine. I was there when Mr. and Mrs. LaQuesta called to see Boyette. 
I was there when Boyd picked up that phone. I was there when Boyd wanted to hug his parents or finally wanted to see him. So perhaps to accept him. I was also the one who convinced him to never see his folks again. You don't need them, I said. You have me. Most importantly, tell them you don't need them. I felt that his parents fucked with him long enough and it was time for him to lead his own life. I was just coming out and full of shit. Too radical for my own good. It tore Boyette up not seeing his parents. He didn't see them for me. For three years, he did it for me. But I wouldn't give, give those three years back. Not seeing his parents made him miserable. And I was too young to realize it. I think that's what contributed to him getting sick sooner than he should. But finally, when Boyette was getting so ill, so sick, went to get his parents, hoping that their presence would make him better. I hope they don't bore you. I have a new lover now, six years, last month. I thought I would stop coming to this by now, but my lover doesn't mind. Thank you, Mrs. Boteng. Salamat, <laughs> salamat. Oh, please don't tell them that it was me who came to the party. Just... What, what, what did you talk about? Oh, uh, nothing. I, I told them how you came to see Boyette. Oh, perfect timing. You know, it was Matthew who was responsible for getting our family back together. When Boyette was sick, Matthew came to get us to visit him in the hospital. We owe it all to Matthew. Matthew explained to us what was going on, about being positive. I, I did not understand. I thought positive was a good thing. Matthew explained to us what is AIDS. Matthew is so good at explaining. You should have stayed a counselor. No, AIDS can be too emotional. That's why I got out of it. I changed my studies to be a little more interesting. That's why I'm a lawyer. AIDS. My God. I was just, I was just getting used to Boyd being gay. Before we went to the hospital, I asked Matthew how he got it. Boyette was only 24. He said, probably when he was a teenager through sex. I said, like, if he were having sex in the park? In the park. When he, he, needs, he needed some place to go. Especially? Especially if he would go home and he discovered that his parents had moved. Nowhere to be found. Matthew took us to the hospital. And there he was. He was skinny again. His eyes barely open. So skinny. So, so skinny. I rocked him gently, like I did when Boyette was a baby. I rocked him back and forth, back and forth. He fits so perfectly in my arms. I asked Jay if he wanted to hold him, hold his son, but Jay said no. That's right. I said no. I couldn't hold him. It seemed too late to hold him. Too late. Instead, I, I rubbed his feet and rubbed his legs, his grasshopper legs. I rocked him back and forth, back and forth. I could tell Jay wanted to hold Boyette. But Jay was strong, maybe too strong, Diba. I, I just rubbed his legs and feet. 
Finally, I got so mad at Jay. So mad. Gago, I said. Stupid. She called me stupid. Gago. Here, hold him. Hold your son. You may never have a chance to hold him again. Hold him. I, I never saw her that way before. That was the first time she called me stupid. The first time. She calls me stupid all the time now. Hold him, I said, over and over again. Hold him, hold him, hold him. To calm her down, I finally said, okay. I did hold him. I rocked him. At first, it was strange. Then it became natural. He was my boy. It hurt seeing the... What do you call it? What? The thing that affected him. What? Uh, dementia? No, the other thing that affected his legs. Neuropathy. Yes, yes, the neuro... No, neuro... Neuropathy. Yes, that one. That one that stopped him from dancing. And he could not dance no more. Can you imagine? No more dancing? No. I cannot. I cannot either. I danced since I was this high. Me too. Danced. Danced and danced. When we were little, we invited spirits to come on special days, birthdays. Yes. Invite spirits and dance for them. Make their favorite food and dance for them. We had to dance for the spirits around a fire. For the spirits to, to make them happy. We were dancing yes. for them. A celebration. <sighs> To make the spirits happy. Happy. We had to dance until we sweat. Perspire and dance some more. And the spirits would see. They were happy because we were dancing for them. Just for them and, and maybe for us too. And they would make sure that we were happy by giving us good luck. The spirits would get rid of the bad luck, the evil ghosts. The demons, right. The demons. Get rid of the demons that plagued us. Back to the fire. That were everywhere to the flames. We would sweat and sweat. And sweat and sweat. And dance some more. Yes. Dance, dance, dance. And sweat some more as if, as if. As if. As if we were on fire, burning away all the demons. On fire, burn them away, all that we did not want in our lives. On fire, burn them away, out of our lives, until... Until? Until... They're gone. Gone. All gone. Gone away. Then we would eat, and eat. And eat again. No, Lori. Eat again? That's right. Eat. Until we were full. That's right. Full. And dance again and again. All over again. When Wyatt could no longer eat, we, we fed him pinataan, warm and soft and smooth. His favorite. In and out of his mouth, he would slowly swallow. I would feed it to him like he was a baby again. But he just lay there, just the skin on his bones. Barely breathing. 
I tried feeding him some more, but he couldn't. Just lay there. Until he was gone. Gone. Gone, gone, gone. Two flames flickering and grooving, rhythmically moving, guiding one small dim light. The two fires overcame the small flame until the dim light took flight. We still leave Ginita'an out for him, for his spirit to enjoy. He visits us on special days. I use coconut juice, lots of it. Boyet loves coconut juice. It's almost time to go. Traffic will be excellent. How it gets. These fundraisers attract lots of celebrities. The dance town is the biggest. All these people cramming in to get a glimpse of the star. I can't believe you keep going to these things. We take some food home. There's plenty for your bow on tomorrow. Sige? You better go. It's getting late. We're going to the dance. We're going to dance the night away. Right? People get silly at these places, dancing crazy. Well, it's all right, sometimes. Except when those young people drink, they go, hoo -hoo. nobody drinks and drives tonight, okay? I heard about this guy who visited high schools to, to talk about drinking and driving. This guy was driving drunk and killed his best friend. The judge did send him to jail. Instead, he ordered this young guy to go to different high schools and talk about how he killed his best friend driving drunk. Can you imagine being condemned to telling such a horrible story over and over again in front of all those people as a way of dealing with your crime? So be careful or you'll end up like him. That poor guy. Well, We'll see you on the dance floor. Thank you for coming and we hope to see you again next year. Mr. La Cuesta pulls out a candle from a shelf and lights it. Puts a bowl of kinataan by his picture. They exit. Two flames flickering and grooving, rhythmically moving, guiding one small dim light. The two fires overcame the small flame until the dim light took flight. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Giovanni Ortega. I am the director of this beautiful piece by Noel Alumit. Um, at this time, we are going to let him into the group. And um, uh, let's see. It's a little dark. Promote the panelist. I think he's with us. There you are! Yay! Hey, Noel. Hi, how are you, Gio? <laughs> <laughs> how was that for you? Oh, that was surreal. It was really, really surreal. I just, um, 
Wow, thank you. I just want to say thank you to the cast. Thank you to you. Um, uh, thank you for, thank you for everyone for coming. I, 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 um, I don't think I can see all of you, but I just want to say thank you. I love that you came and that you're here, and it was just really terrific. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna um, we're gonna open it up in just a moment. If you want to speak, I was, I'm like typing to the panelists. I could actually say it out loud. If you want to speak um, or have a comment or a question, go ahead and make a comment on the chat room. And then we'll make sure that we allow you some time to speak. Thank you so much for everyone who's speaking. I think Noelle was, is a little muted right now. But, oh, there you are. Um, uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about this piece. What was the genesis of it? It's, um, yeah, I'll give you some time to share. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank the Asian Pacific AIDS Intervention Team. APA. They have this project called um, uh, At Malay's House for um, Homeless LGBT People. I wrote this play, gosh, like over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, actually, when I was working for APIT. And at the time I was doing a lot of AIDS work. I did AIDS work for, for 20 years. Um, and uh, I saw a lot out in the community. And I think one of the ways I could sort of deal with the grief of what was going on was to, was to write this play. And um, it has a very special place in my heart because now I am a writer. And that was like my first like, piece that was taken seriously. You know, it's gotten into production thing. And uh, it was the first time I've ever seen anything I ever wrote um, performed. So uh, La Quest has always been a, a very special uh, piece of writing to me. You know, it's so interesting, especially how some things are still so relevant. You know, the Supreme Court just passed that law um, in the last in the last week. And um, I'm just uh, this as a, a queer Filipino, this is so, it touches a chord, right? Especially yeah. when, when you're, you start a relationship um, and then you're, do you tell your folks? Who do you tell? Because all your life they're saying, oh, it's okay for me. It's like, it's okay if you're gay, but just, uh, it's okay if they're gay, just, just don't be, you know? So it does touch a chord in my heart when, you know, people would tell me, Okay, lang kung bakla sila. It's okay if they're bakla. Just, just um, if you are, just don't tell anyone. <laughs> you know? So, um, it's funny because these narratives still exist today. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. It's it's still relevant, um, for 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 Filipinos around the world and the lambs for that matter. Um, you know, why don't we bring the cast into the group? Yay. Let's give them a round of applause, everybody. Hello, everyone. All right. Um, I have some feedback. I'm gonna I'm just gonna try to move. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the this. Virtual reality, virtual theater. Uh, so thanks for people who are sharing. Q&A, look, there's some questions, yay. Um, Brady Rubin is sharing right now. You can answer. If, if P I'm giving space for people to share if they want, um, Brady. If you're there, you could. I think you're allowed to speak. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I, I'm. We'll we'll hold off on that. But uh, a, a round of shout out and applause to Ginger Leopoldo for making this happen. By the way, thank you, um, Ginger. Can you can you share a little bit about? What made you want to do La Cuesta and the history of it all? Yes, for sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Gio. Uh, thank you, of course, Noel. Uh, thank you to my fellow class uh, castmates, um, 
Romel and George. Um, I also want to uh, give some thanks to Noah Ohashi. He was one of our capstone scholars who helped with some production support. The musician, Gio, how you've got to tell us how you were able to get uh, the permission to get some of that music going. That was pretty amazing. And thanks to Patrick, of course, as well, who has been helpful and uh, just getting all of the technical uh, things arranged. This is, of course, a new way for us to uh, share stories. And uh, this is one of our first ever kind of virtual productions, one of the first ones I've ever tried kind of live. So um, back in 2009 is when uh, this play was uh, brought to Circa Pintig to consider uh, to produce. Uh, initially, Louis Sisson, one of our uh, Circa members, uh, decided to direct along with Yao Trung, and uh, we performed it in the basement of a church in the northwest side of Chicago. Uh, was just a wonderful, lovely, kind of short, quick, roller coaster ride essentially and um and ever since you know having had that opportunity to um to share it with the community and to have our talkbacks and discussions around these issues um as noel mentioned it too has a very special place in my heart definitely one of the more favorite uh, stories that I like to uh, come back to and any opportunity to share it uh, with the world <laughs> is always, um, you know, something I think of. We were able to uh, revive this a couple of times uh, throughout the years, even brought it to the Philippines in this sort of stage reading format. And one of the things I know about theater that I've learned is that you've just got to trust the playwright. And again, the words and the story is just there. There is nothing much more for us to do than just share it. So um, Circa Pintig is always so honored uh, whenever uh, we have these kinds of opportunities. And again, so grateful to the playwright and all of the artists that rally behind um, and uh, you know, also um, come and spend time uh, to tell this story. So we're just <laughs> very pleased and how appropriate for Pride Month, of course, with everything yeah, going on. Uh, this is the one after, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we had our open mic uh, and then I said, Gio, we've got to do La Cosa. And right away, I sent a message to Noel and again, so honored for uh, him to uh, give us uh, consent uh, to share this story and how fortunate to have found uh, the organization to support. We reproduced it back in 2012, supported an organization in the Philippines that uh, helped with education and AIDS work as AIDS was on the rise just less than a decade ago in the Philippines. And so we were able to raise some funds to benefit uh, that organization, but how wonderful that we can uh, benefit, especially the organization that Noel did some uh, work with uh, back when he started writing this 25 years ago. So it's coming full circle. Great, great. Thank you so much, Ginger. Um, uh, we have some questions, so I gave access to several people who would like to ask some questions. Uh, Robert, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, I just want to thank everyone. What a wonderful journey you took me on. I'm so glad I didn't know anything about the story. It started with the dancing. Okay, they're dancers. They love to dance. I didn't know where it was going. And then, yes, you had a son, and then he loved to dance. And then, oh my God, it gets kicked out. <laughs> and then the boyfriend comes in, and I'm thinking, okay, well, Boyette's going to come. He's, oh man, I was so sad at the end. You guys really had me. So thank you so much. <laughs> my question to Noel is when you were working with people with AIDS, did you ever meet someone who was abandoned by their parents? Um, thank you, Rob, for coming. I value your friendship and I love that you're here. And I, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that you didn't think, uh, I was afraid that people would, wouldn't get that he's dead. Um, 
that that was the idea was that uh, we think he's coming and then we find oh it's it's his spirit that's coming um and yeah when i and i did aids work sure i did a lot I and mean, that's one of the reasons why um Mellie's, Aunt Mellie's house is here um is because there are lgbtq people who are homeless or they're kicked out i read a, a horrible statistic about um in los angeles like a high percentage of homeless youth are lgbt um and that, that was a shock like 40 percent of of homeless youth in los angeles are lgbt um, youth and that was just that's shocking to me and so um uh when I first started doing AIDS work, I started doing AIDS work in a hospice. Um, and that is when people are in their last stages um, of AIDS. And back then there was no treatment. And so when you went to the hospice, it meant you had about six months to die. And and it was um I was I was a young person, so it was it was moving to me um to experience that. That there are there are people who did not want to see members of their family there and it was also the very first time i saw an asian person there and a filipina actually a filipino woman um was dying there and she looked like a lot of the people i knew so to um uh to experience people who their families didn't want to see them anymore um they were ashamed of them was just heartbreaking to me and um and also when i was working at apit yeah a, a lot of my work was in in the queer community and i did a lot of work around um supporting lgbt youth lgbt um asian pacific islander individuals and um when i was a case manager uh one of the things i had to do was try to find housing for some of the the people who who had no place to live you know so um all that entire experience was just um heartbreaking to see and witness. Thanks. Thank you so much, Noel um, and Robert, for that question. I have another person who'd like to ask a question, Rohan. Hey, Rohan. Hi. Hey, Rohan. <laughs> Oh my god, this is amazing. Okay, first of all, Ginger, I love you so much. I'm hugging you. <laughs> I'm so happy you got to come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just here to like just say hi, this was amazing. I loved it. Um, this has been great for me because you know, this is Pride Month and you know, being black and Asian, I was actually just at a protest for Asians for Black Lives, so happy Juneteenth. Woo! Um mm. And um, I was just I was just curious, like what this process felt like for everybody, because you know we're so used to doing our art in the same space in the same room, and COVID's is things. Now we're all like not gonna do that anymore. So like, what was this process like for everybody? What, like, what did it feel like, or what changed? What was the same? You know. <laughs> well, well, let's <laughs> let's ask the actors. <laughs> How was that? Uh, Ginger, Ramel, or, or George? I keep on calling George Matthew for some reason. I mean, he's, I'm sure he's so over it. I just keep on saying Matthew. You're so but, the uh, director that does that. Call us by our like character. I do. Name. And yes. I do. But um, yeah, I want to open it up to uh, Ramel or George, who hasn't said anything, but said so much during the show. So. I, uh, I I feel like it was, uh, it's it, the nerves were still there kind of before getting on. I was like, oh, it's like waiting in the wings and it, all those feelings are still kind of there um, for performing a show. Um, and I think the process of, uh, you know, trying to be connected as much as you can with your other players in a virtual setting is a little different. I mean, I find I found it a little like, like my I my frame is so. I'm usually doing this um, much tighter than I'm used to. But it was uh, it was really nice to it. It felt good to feel connected to um, the piece and um, everybody else, especially uh, through the rehearsals, especially running it again. Hear like really you know hearing these uh, hearing the words because you know. It was, focusing on um and i thought it was a great experience well, um, me for me <laughs> um i think that the similarity 
it's mostly like I'm picking, I'm just focusing on ginger on the screen and just pick up the minor nuances, everything that she gives me and like from her voice, just focusing on her voice and just on the screen. And I think it's the, the difference is the physical interaction that's missing. And I think that's very crucial in a sense, but I just try to compensate it with the visual and then the audio and then take it from there. It's hard, but yeah, different, yeah. but you know. It is yeah, I, I keep disappearing. I don't even know how to deal with this. The <laughs> fact that like my red flower go like how how do you, I try to look for a YouTube to help me have better technique. But for me, what was lovely about this Rohan is I get to work with folks in Los Angeles and I'm still here in Chicago. <laughs> like how fantastic is that? All I had to do was just, you know, have a later rehearsal start time and show time, but that's okay. And I think now we have the ability to do this kind of work global, national, like we can do stuff and it can be shared and how fantastic that we can also document, record and archive such stories as this so that it can continue to be shared. So even though it was rough not being able to have the sort of intimate space and reactions and sounds from, you know, your castmates and the audience, I'm just so forward thinking about how much more of a great opportunity this could be because the message is being told and can be told again um, to other groups, so. Yeah, and I also want to say, you know, I, um, even though this play's been around for a little bit, um, I've only seen it a few times. I saw the San Francisco production. I didn't get a chance to see the Chicago production of it. Um, they did a reading of it in New York, but it's never been done in Los Angeles, in my hometown, <laughs> interestingly enough. So um, what's been, my mother and my sister are watching it in another room. And so it was actually the first time that my mother was able to see this play, um, as, well as, my, as well as some of my Los Angeles friends to see, to see this, um, because it's never, really, it's never been done in LA proper. So. Uh, it was surreal seeing this. I never got a, got a chance to see Ginger's performance. And so um, being able to see it um, was, was really terrific. And seeing all of you was really wonderful. And, and my mom, I, I was going in and out to the different rooms to, to see what they thought of it. And she said, um, uh, when are they going to start dancing? They're in the same room. <laughs> 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 no, they're in different cities, you know. They, she thought that you, <laughs> we thought you were all in the same room, you know, um, doing this. <laughs> so, so the magic of Zoom uh, really, you know, uh, can be real. Can be really a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So, <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, Ernie Gonzalez Jr. had a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Thanks. Uh, my question was just, I had the process question too. I was just answering. Just, you know, what challenges you all had to overcome to get this wonderful piece together? Uh, and that was really kind of just answered. But thank you so much for uh, bringing this great story to light. I just enjoyed it. And I also thought it was, I didn't know you were in Chicago. So, oh. I mean, I, I think, you know, using the same background and it really seemed like you were breathing the same air um and i'm mexican but i felt like y'all could have been my parents like it was <laughs> it was really wonderful and um even though it's so specific still yet yeah, very universal uh so thank you so much for bringing this to us today thank you ernie yeah, I, I thank you ernie friends thank, thank you, you ernie. Ernie. I, I was telling some friends now i know a lot of productions have been canceled because of covid and everything and we're sort of different places but i said well now theaters like circuit and dig and others are um can actually have actors anywhere in the world yeah. <laughs> you know do these readings now um i don't know if john ruby's here but he's my acting teacher but um, he is. He's here. Uh, he, yes he is thank you john for coming but he would have these readings and there'd be people from different parts of the country you know reading doing a table read of the same script and it's, so that's What's been really interesting about having technology, you know, is that um, we are in different places. We can sort of be in the same place at the same time, and um, it's kind of magical like that. Yeah, John, did you want to share something? I just wanted to say, uh, great job, actors, really wonderful. 
Uh, Noel, really uh, great to hear your writing. Um, and I just, to me, what's wonderful is just hearing diverse voices, just this idea of stories that need to be told and should be told. And, you know, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but being like a straight white dude from the Midwest, it's so nice to hear other voices and other things. And just like, to me, that like diversity is what is a strength, you know, it's a strength. And, and yes, I think someone else said it too. It's like, there's a university, there's a universalness to what was going on here but it's also super specific you know to this world and so um you know kudos noel to you and, and to all the actors because you really and the directing you really brought it to life so thank you thanks, thank you, thanks. Um, thanks so yeah much. i start, yeah when i when i wrote this actually i mean in the 90s i was i was heavily pursuing acting and so one of the things i wanted to do was to make sure that asian actors had a chance to work and had a chance to you know to to do this and i started acting again um, with with John Ruby and um, uh, it's funny because now I'm close to the oh. age where I can actually play the dad role. Now. <laughs> Before when I was just you know I, I could have I could have been Matthew, um, but now I'm like 25 years later I can play the father. So you know. <laughs> Future philosophy yeah. writers out there create roles that you, for yourself as you get older. Remember that. I know that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted, we have a cool, wait, here is a, oh, Carolyn Castro Arvis says, congratulations. Um, I'll answer to Ernie's question in, in regards to the process real quick, and then Conrad has a, uh, a question, and um, I think is Tita G in the room, or, so we'll yes. we'll bring her in in just a second as well. Um, so, so in regards to the process, I think what was really interesting about this, aside from the nature um, of this doing this isolated piece, is that. Uh, it, it becomes a sonic universe, right? So if we really think about Boyet as this ghost that permeates through their lives, regardless if it's a real ghost or like a, like a physical ghost or a visceral spiritual ghost, that is actually what these, in my purview as a director, it's actually what these two people are going through as a couple. So when Matthew comes in, he's like, Oh, you're still thinking? Uh, is has he arrived yet? He Matthew, in essence, kind of hopped onto this bandwagon of the the visceral spiritual ghost exists. So when we tackled this text, um, it was really interesting because we're they're actually the how 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 apropos for a couple to be together but so separate when the loss of a child happens. They have, that, they have that similarity. They lost that child that they love so much. But in essence, it really separated them in so many ways, right? So having this remote presence of directing this piece, I think there's a sense of like, I can't even be with my loved one right now as I'm dealing through this grief that's gone on for a while. So that, that was a thing that I wanted to kind of, I didn't talk about it, but that was kind of like a key of how they would get to their place. I didn't even ask them anything, but, but being alone in a room without your loved one dealing with grief and loss of a child, they got, I felt like they got there. I think y'all saw that as well. <clears throat> in addition to that, the music, which I, I do want to give a big um, shout out to Patrick, who was doing so much work. Um, Patrick. So the, the music permeates throughout the very beginning, if you didn't notice, Florante Aguilar's beautiful music. But it's interesting that near the end, the music stops when they start talking about it, because that in itself is the way they were trying to grieve the loss of a child, but the music is gone. No matter how much people dance to, you know, like we kept on dancing and dancing, the music is, is kind of gone. It's, it's in that spiritual, visceral spiritual 
world that Boyet is now living in. So you, you might not be able to hear it, but they're now like living it inside. So that's my take on it, Noel. I hope that's okay. <laughs> He's like, girl, I don't know what you've been drinking. No, or I, eating. no really, I think that that is it, it's so interesting because you know when you, I, I sort of I mean, you know, I, I wrote it a long time ago, <laughs> a long time ago. So to to see you interpret these themes and pick up those themes and all of the actors um, really dig into it was 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 really refreshing. Um, as the actors will tell you, I did I didn't stick around for a lot of the rehearsals because I just thought you know um, let 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 them have it. I mean, they can let them have it so they can do whatever they want to do with it, you know? So uh, thank you so much for that interpretation. All of you, thank you. Thanks. We have, um, uh, we have like nine minutes before we get booted out, thanks to Zoom. Uh, Conrad had a question and then um, Ita G. Yeah, hi everybody. Hey. Oh. hey, great. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say how much I love this play. Thank you for all the work that you all did and directing choices. Choices were great. Um, and Noel, I, I actually did get to see this in San Francisco a couple of times when it first premiered there. Um, and it's uh, actually one of the plays that spurred me to be a playwright. So thank you for, for creating this work. Um, but I also wanted to say, because it has been a while since I guess you've seen this, um, and s uh, if you had a chance to revisit this, would there be anything that you'd like to try differently? Yeah, I was I was telling um, uh, some members of the cast and, and Francis as well. It's a, it's a, I wrote it 25 years ago and that it was obviously to me, I, 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 I hear it um, and I says, well, it's, it sounds like a very young writer, you know, to me. Um, I mean, it was the first thing I ever really, really wrote and finished. So um, I think I would have, if I were to re rewrite it today, which I wouldn't, I'd leave it just the way it is because I think it's a document of who I was as a, as a writer then. But I would probably take take off the last monologue about the drunk driving. Um, I probably would take that out because it felt like it's too on the nose to me, you know? Um, and um, I would maybe add, make it more clear that it's, um, an AIDS dance marathon, which was very prevalent in the 90s. I mean, they, they had them everywhere. I don't know if they're doing them anymore, but um, the, the dance -a-thon, the AIDS dance -a -thon was done everywhere. And so when you said a fundraiser that people would get it, but I don't know if people would get that today. So um, maybe I would have maybe changed it a little bit to, um, to uh, make it more obvious, I guess. But those are just some of the things that I, I would have changed, but, um, I'm not going to. It, it was a piece in time. It was a place um, in time in my life that that um, was wonderful and surreal, yet sad and complicated. So, <laughs> um, again, what what the actors and what Gio did was just terrific. Well, it's perfect. Thank you for inspiring me and for all of us. Thanks. Oh, thank you. That's so. I'm so touched to hear that. Oh. Really, so touched to hear that. Thanks. Thanks, Conrad. Um, also, we have, um, I think, a Neri group uh, has a question. Hi, everybody. This is Irene from Hi, Irene. Hi, guys. Congratulations, everyone. Um, I don't know any of you except Ginger. And I want to say I did see the 2009 performance in Chicago. Ginger, um, how do you feel this one was different from that one besides you being pregnant with Olive? at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, again, I mean, that was such an intimate space. And, you know, part of the work we do, we end up, you know, being the artist and kind of in the mode of creation, then we end up not having the ability to do our outreach and get people in the seats. But even in those nights when we would have a show, and it was like in February, there was like a serious snowstorm that happened back in 2009. We had maybe one or two in the audience, but it was still a story worth telling. And, and those actually moments where you kind of know that the person sitting in the seat watching and listening to you is on edge about what is happening 
for a performer, like that is just so satisfying. And that's the kind of magic I think that we all kind of experience and, and strive for and, and just are in joy with. Um, so, you know, looking back at it in 2009, I just recall and I think that's part of why, you know, it has that special place in my heart. I've had those experiences with this uh, role and with this story. Well, you look fantastic. Thanks, you guys. It was wonderful. Thanks, Irene. All right. Um, I think we're about to um, finish off. I do want to say thank you so much, Ginger, as a fellow Chicago, and it's 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 weird. All of us are in in LA, but you know, George and I are from the hometown of Chicago. So, um, thank, thanks, Noel. I think I'm getting the sign if we have a few minutes left. Um, thank you, Noel, Romel, George, Patrick. Can we see your face? Can can we just give this guy has been doing so much tech work and sound work. All the sound is coming from wherever he is. And um, thank you, Gio. No, thank you. We'll hand it over to to Circapintig Ginger before yes. we head out. Lisa Jing, if you have any final words for us as well. She's coming in from New York, so we're all kind of spread out. Yeah. East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. Well, I am just here in New York temporarily, but Chicago is always home. And I'm sure for George and Gio, Chicago will always be home. Always. And thank you. Yes. So thank you and congratulations to everyone. Such powerful work. And you know how when we, you first staged it in Chicago, it brought tears to my eyes and it made me cry again this time around. It never lost or loses its power. Um, and so this is um, when we first staged it in Chicago, um, nobody talked about AIDS uh, in, in the Filipino community. So we love, we were the first to talk about very sensitive issues uh, in Chicago, such as this one. And so we pride ourselves for continuing to do the same thing. And so all we could say is we are indebted to people like you, Noel, for, um, and the other playwrights like Conrad, we've done his work too, and Gio's work. We, you know, you have written these works, and so we feel that it's our obligation to share that work to the public. And so, um, with the limitation of, you know, brought about by the pandemic, and we can't get together, we have found creative ways of still bringing the stories to our communities and to the public. And so, We'd like to thank you all for making sure, for making this happen. And we'd like for you to continue to keep writing and then we'll keep, and for the actors to keep performing and for all the supporters of our work to make sure that we are, we continue to be engaged in this important work we need each other and that's the only thing that we could continue to make this happen and and again we can't thank you enough for bringing this to life thank you thank you everyone we Here. encourage you to please support apaits um organization. Uh, you can even go to the Target registry and order items. My family and I did this. Amazing. Um, all proceeds this month uh, that you make uh, to circapintig.org uh, is tax deductible and all of any monies we raise this month is going to this organization. So again, thank you, Noel, so much for uh, sharing this work and it's one way for us to uh, be able to give back. Uh, circapintig.org is our new site uh, that shows some of the direct service work that we're doing. We've got a podcast. Thanks, Conrad, for helping us set up with that. And again, uh, forever thanks to Gio and Romel and Matthew, George, <laughs> and Patrick. Um, and we're just so happy that you had a chance to join us. We hope 
to have more of these kinds of gatherings. Uh, so please uh, stay in touch. And yeah, um, Dr. Pintig, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. George, you have a sign? <laughs> Circapintig.org, <laughs> exactly. O-R-G. We love you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>